we have a lot to get through tonight, and uh, I think we will go ahead and just just go ahead and dive in. So uh, our agenda tonight: um, Where are we at today? We're going to talk about the RKG plan um, from a layman's perspective, from a real real world perspective, not just what you're hearing from the consultant that's getting paid. Uh, we're going to talk about paper compliance, why we don't have it. We're going to talk about uh, the definition of unconstrained land and a mandatory mixed use district. That's our center business district. We require mixed use in, in the center business district. And the current status, what, what has happened and what uh, our planning board has sent along to the EOHLC, which is the Executive Housing of Livable Communities, headed by Se Secretary Augustus, Housing Secretary Augustus. Then we're going to dive in quickly to our exemption case. Why does Winthrop deserve an exemption? Why are we different? Uh, what what are the implications of what what we've done here, and who are the players? And then um, the most probably interesting to everybody tonight is going to be the citizens initiative petition. What's the law? What we did? How our town has handled it? And, and what's next? And we really want, want you to share your thoughts. Any, anything to say right off the bat or no? Oh, okay. All right. Here we go. All right. Where are we at? Um, we, the people, have filed an, an, a case in Superior Court seeking an exemption. We, the people, have petitioned to ensure that the citizens are the decision makers here. Those on the town council who have conflicted interests have actually rebuffed our exemption. They ref refuse to join our exemption. There's just a couple. It's actually one uh, who, who, who has, well, no, I take that back. There's three who have refused to. Yes, we'll talk about that. Uh, the planning board has put forward a pre-adoption plan to RKG that overzones Winthrop. So we're going to talk about that because it includes our center business district, which is truly the future of this town in terms of our viability commercially. The town council president seeks to vote. or so, uh, I just want to point out that if Milton wins, um, those four grants that are in the statute still survive. And this has become a political issue, so the people that are pushing to comply today will still comply if Milton wins, just an FYI. Um, and, then, and then we all need to just talk about what to do next, considering everything that's been going on here. I mean, that's what this is for. This, uh, I think, I'm, I'm hoping that this is a lively conversation. Don't feel stifled. Don't feel like you have to um, comply by these unusual rules that we have in the town council meetings. Um, I've been to the Boston Tea Party Museum twice this month, and uh, I, I guarantee those, those town meetings, the, even though they're mock town meetings, are, are quite, quite lively indeed. Any questions? before we get started. So we'll get more than three minutes? Yes. All right. Yes, but don't, don't, don't use it. We do have a lot to get through. Okay, next. Um, Winthrop is a prime target for 3A. 3A is um, a greater burden on towns like ours. Uh, we have amongst the highest density counts in the nation, not just in Massachusetts. And two, two ways in and out. Two ways in and out. Uh, Winthrop is, a, is actually a very desirable place for these types of units. We'll, we'll talk about the types of units that 3A ha, has in, it, in its um, gaze. Uh, but, but essentially, if, if, if you're thinking about um, moving into one of these places, you don't want to be four miles from a train station, you don't want to be four miles from your neighbor. I mean, Weston, which is on the left, is, is, is essentially um, you know, a beautiful community, but at the end of the day, uh, it isn't probably the best location for these micro units that are being proposed. Um, 
I do want to take a step back quickly uh, and talk a little bit about the Milton case just because I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't. Um, today, uh, Milton was heard. It was an hour long after six plus months of, of long awaited uh, deliberation. Uh, att uh, attorney Haskell, who represented, represented the uh, Attorney General's office, called these um, what, what uh, the Attorney General seeks to, to claim as guidelines, he called them, or regulations, he called them guidelines with te teeth. To which the SJC responded, what's the difference between guidelines with teeth and regulations? Uh, also, very importantly, I don't know if you caught this, Michael, too, um, Kevin Martin made a comment that zoning laws, just like election laws, are controlled entirely by statute. Did you catch that? That was pretty good because that, that, that's important for our purposes. Um, we're, we're talking today about a petition that is, in, is controlled entirely by statute. Uh, and, and our certain men, members of our town leadership have, have gone off, off script there. Um, but back to, back to this picture here. Um, uh, this idea of just pushing density is not going to solve the uh, housing affordability crisis. It will actually continue to drive up housing costs. Density doesn't make things cheaper. It doesn't. It, density makes things more expensive. Okay, and that's because in this case, and we'll talk about it in a second, um, what this law has that's very specific and very unique is a, is a guideline that says you can't have a minimum bedroom size, you can't have a maximum number of bedrooms, and you can't have an occupancy limit. That's very specific and very unusual, and it allows landlords to charge by the head. Just keep that in mind. So if you're, you know, if you're talking about Weston, you get five acres. If you're talking about Boston, you get a 500 square foot apartment, essentially. All right, let's dive into the RKG plan. Okay, so when have you ever seen a sign or a note or anything on anything that says no occupancy limit? Never. Never. Not in an elevator. Well, right? an elevator, yeah. Or a whole no bunch. occupancy limit. No, no occupancy limit. Mm -hmm. But not in a club, mm -hmm. not in a bar, mm -hmm. not in a house. Imagine seeing no occupancy limit anywhere being the rule. This is very specific, and they're adamant about it. And I would also argue that this is probably the most defining difference between what we have here in Winthrop and 3A. Apart from loss of rights to developers, this is really the most defining difference zoning-wise uh, between what we have here in Winthrop and what is in 3A and what is required under 3A. Um, so 3A says that Winthrop needs to zone for 882 units. <laughs> Uh, with high density apartments and across 12 acres, minimum of 15 units per acre, this is not paper compliance as uh, RKG would have you believe. In fact, RKG has gone ahead and zoned for 43.5 acres. And the way that they did that is that they um, actually, in, in the model, which we'll talk about in a second, they put lower numbers in their model than what would actually exist on the ground today. Uh, I don't know how they got it. I've asked for, for how they got those calculations. I have gotten no response, but it's, it's very unusual, and uh, I don't think it's the 15 units per acre. I think it's something else, but that's that remains to be seen. Any questions on this? Of course, yes. No occupancy limits. So they have a house, they can put 50 people in there? Yes. Yeah, yeah so. Guidelines have to be totally legal. What about fire? Fire and fire. Uh, the, so the statute, yeah, there's gotta be the, the statute okay. says, section 3A says that anything that's zoned under 3A is still subject to the, to the sanitary code and the environmental code. Mm -hmm. 
But by definition, that does include the building code, the fire code, or any of the rest of it. And then in the guidelines, they say, don't zone for anything other than the absolute minimum state compliance. They say, we don't want to look at any other state law that can comply with this, build whatever the hell you want, and as much as you can get away with. No, remember the fire code? No, it's, it's actually there's a good argument if you were to stand up and be a real jerk that uh, I'm a developer and I don't have to build anything to fire code because it's not one of the two things it's subject to. Exactly. And, and by the way, the sanitary code is nothing to write home about. It, it says that it's uh, if you want a bedroom that's for one person, you you have to have at least 70 square feet. That's like a rug. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah. Equivalent of a closet. It's smaller than a prison cell in uh, some kind of house corrections. Correct. It, and if you have if you have more than one person, so two or more people, you only have to account for 50 square feet of person in the bedroom. What? So now we're talking about 200 square feet for four people, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have to have somebody monitoring that. We're not great at that here. The people in the green, all the people in the green industry, they get any idea of what all this fine print means? I mean, really good question. Because you're more on. <laughs> really good question. You have to be looking away. You have to be looking away. Skip, if, if I may, all right? How many people here are for 3A? Show of hands. Who's here for 3A? Nobody. How many counselors who are against or are for 3A are here? Nobody. They didn't bother to show up and listen to their community. You vote them out. Period. This belt so, controls this area. So, um, yeah, there's one that lives around the corner. Too. Okay, next. This belt. All right, so this is a, uh, a screenshot from the Arcade G plan. And um, just uh, by way of example, so you see a modeled capacity, 318 units, existing units, 393. So why is it lower? Well, if they say it's lower, I don't know how they got there because they won't answer my emails. Um, then they get to add this little guy over here, right? 23 units, zero residential units. So they're spreading out because they need to make a, a certain density, right? No clue why, just nobody can answer it on the planning board, nobody will, I, I should say. Um, if they're not residential units, what are they gonna be? The no, they're gonna be residential units. <laughs> well, it's zero. Now, it's zero now, and then when you put it in a 3A zone, it's going to change, precisely. Um, so, uh, okay. That's, Matter of fact, the state statute says that in order to have an MBTA zoning district, you have to have a minimum of 15 units per acre. But then the state housing department will now gave both acreage and units. And when you put Winthrop's units over Winthrop's acreage, you come out with a statutory uh, density of 73.5 units per acre. I don't know how you can make that work with something that's skyscraper. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Like and you can't yeah. build up because of the when we board. talk to the planning board and the town council, when we talk to the planning board and the town council, no, they're stressing minimum. They're stressing minimum under the law. I've written to them several times asking, what are the maximum number of units that could be built in those zones? And they're not answering us because when a developer comes in, they're not gonna be satisfied with the minimum. The minimum is there. What they want is the maximum. And yet we're not getting information about that. And I just have to add one more point that's a real constitutional issue. If you live in a zone, you are losing all of your local zoning rights and restrictions and protections. That is unfair under the Constitution. You cannot apply a law to some people in Winthrop and not to other people. You cannot penalize some people and not other people. That is a flagrant violation of our constitutional rights with equal treatment and protection under the law. Thank you, Karen. And where is well, the so land coming from that they're building? Like, very good question. Uh, one more one, 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 I'll come to you in just a, just a moment. Uh, if, you're, if you're not familiar with the 3A suitability map, this comes from the MAPC, which, uh, which I was very angry about at first, but now I've been a very handy. Um, so uh, this is just, again, by way of example, st sticking with Governor's Park. 
Uh, according to the MAPC, so this is back to the, is there, is this a paper compliance plan? No, they didn't, when you think of paper compliance, paper compliance, just for those um, starting out on this journey, it, it is a way of zoning in such a way that nothing will be built. That's the idea behind paper compliance. And in, and in our town, we're, we're very highly dense, and that would result in little boxes around the existing buildings. As we found out, that also hurts the people that are in the boxes because 3A supersedes condo docks. However, that isn't what they did here. They drew a circle, okay? Um, and, and the MAPC has been working very hard at this and they have determined that each one of these circles, and again, Governor's Park is an example, has a, a, an amount of unconstrained land. What is unconstrained land according to the MAPC, which is, you can think of them like the lobbyist arm of the governor's office. Unconstrained land is um, parcels with higher unconstrained land area have more available land for development and therefore receive a higher suitability. So in Governor's Park, we've got 11.9 acres, uh, not 98 acres of unconstrained land of the total acreage of 14, so 12 and then 14. And then they add this little piece here, that's another acre. So now we've got, now we've got uh, 13 acres of unconstrained land to build on, which is not, not paper compliance and it gets worse. And I promise I'll get to my point about the exemption and everything else in just a second. I just want to make a point here. Um, they also included our entire center business district. This is what offends me most about this entire situation. Utile was at least smart enough, Utile was our previous consultant before RKG, to leave out our center business district. And the reason being is that they said, we think that you would probably want to don't, you know, design this yourself. We think that the town wants to retain control over your center business district, so we'll leave that alone. Not RKG. RKG has included the entire center business district. That's the purple, I know it's a little hard to see, probably on purpose. I'm not trying to be conspiracy theory or anything, but. Um, um, and they're calling it an offset, which is an overlay. It's, except it's a worse. It's worse in, in, in that under 3A, an offset is not compliant, but has to comply. And in a, in a business district, in a mandatory mis, mixed use district, that means you can't you know, have a minimum bedroom size, you can't have a maximum number of bedrooms, you can't have occupancy limits, you also can't require uh, parking for non-residential uses. They're saying it's non-compliant because it has non-residential uses included, okay? They're also saying that, um, okay, it can still be mixed use, but you can't have true mixed use. True mixed use involves more than one story. Say we want to have a, a doctor's office. It doesn't have to just be on the ground floor. We can, we can make that a couple levels. We can have an office building, okay? Under 3A, you could only have non-residential dental use on the ground floor. I, and again, these are by right. So if you don't know what that is, it just means that you don't need special permission. Our center business district is for businesses. It's not for residencies. It's not so that we can sprinkle in businesses with our residents. It's for businesses, and if we want to add resident residential units to our business district, we can, but it's ours to design, you know, and if you're, if you're like me, you're feeling like it's looking kind of great these days, and you know, with, uh, with the coffee shop having moved over to the center, it kind of livens up the place, and we're talking about putting our Christmas tree back and stuff like that, like, this is crazy, and it really pinches our businesses. Because if we're saying you can't require parking as a business, and we're and we're doing this, and we're and we're requiring all these things, um, it's going to kill our businesses, and it's not fair 
because this is a workspace. This is our center. And if you think of all the places that you like to vacation, you could probably think of the center, like Newburyport and things like that. But not going Winthrop all that well, what I can tell you is that between the 2010 census and the 2020 census, you increase the number of small businesses in Winthrop alone by almost 25%. That's a hell of a growth rate. And very few cities in this community, in this state can match that. And so naturally, we're going to squish it. <laughs> I wanted to share with you, I had the opportunity to write to the State House after this first became a problem. And the problem started with that Winthrop was not qualified because she needed to have more than 9,000 to qualify for exemption. That was number one. Number two, the nine states that go back to November, okay, are Arizona, California, the District of Columbia, Hawaii, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, North Carolina, and Washington. These nine states have already been told now, we saw our own governor up there at the Democratic Convention. She already knew she was going to be a speaker. I, no offense to anybody that's a Democrat yet. But you can see the politics behind it. And the statement, one of the statements that was being made, the bill that was filed in the Commonwealth, that this was going to be under 3A, definitely affordable, low-income housing. Period. The end. So there, with all the ins and outs and ups and downs, that's what it's come down to. Low income housing, she'll go to any place that doesn't carry 9,000 or less residential people in these nine states. Now why just the nine states? Politically reasoning, and this comes from the state, not from me. Be careful what you wish for. What's your name? Dottie D'Onofrio. Dottie. Dottie. Dottie brings up a really good point, and I hope it's my next slide, but I'm not really sure. Um, ah, okay. It is, potentially. Uh, so, so 3A eliminates affordable housing. Uh, I was just going to say, it cuts back on it. Yes, it cuts back on it. Um, so, oh, and, and one more thing about the, the CBD before we... Um, move away from it. Um, you've heard maybe some of these Pro 3A folks talk about a uh, site plan review. That's just like a setbacks in the front. Okay? That doesn't help. Setbacks in the front. Okay. Uh, all, right. all right. Why does Winthrop deserve, deserve an exemption? Can I have one question? Yes, of course. Hi. Regarding the legend, good evening. Regarding the legend we're seeing in the CBD, um, in looking at that closely, all of that purple area are four-story buildings. The uh, the, uh, the DACA area is two and a half story. As it is already, my concerns are that it's already a concrete jungle down there, and without sunlight, how much colder is it going to get? So again, to your point, it's a community, it's a public area for all of us, and I think we should uh, if any, green it up instead of docking it. So. Love that. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Costner. Really good point. Uh, all right. So why does Winthrop deserve an exemption? Um, all right. So densifying one of the densest communities in the nation with this densification law is harmful. 3A seeks to allow for multifamily housing. Wither Party has 65% multifamily housing. Wither is built out. Unlike other towns, that picture that you saw earlier of Weston, um, we actually had three undeveloped acres left in 2005. 83 units to go before we were deemed built out. Since then, we've, we've built approximately 230 homes. We have well surpassed what we're even able to accommodate today. And um, if you have heard about this two and a half um, prob override, um, that's probably uh, an, out an outcome of something like that, where we are just, um, according to the head of the finance committee, I believe, I think Shan's in the room, she can correct me if I'm wrong, at, at a recent review of our budget, 
we are growing faster than we can afford, is my understanding. So at the end of the day, we we were built out, we were built out of, about a decade back. Uh, we are also geographically compromised. Okay, um, someone mentioned it earlier. Uh, increased traffic hinders our access to emergency care and exacerbates already compromised evacuation capabilities. 45% of Winthrop is in a flood zone, and we have two egress points that are constantly being closed as a result. Point Shirley is constantly being blocked as well. Yeah, good point. Good point. There's no um, evacuation route. That's right. Oh. Do we keep asking, where is the evacuation route? I can answer that. I can answer that. That was a, that was a uh, question so, I had so. for our town manager, and he unequivocally said to me, in the event of a disaster, there is no evacuation plan for winter. Yay! Not only that, but even and if you get in the same kind of trouble, there. there's no help coming. Because if you think about it, with no, with no disrespect to Winthrop's police and fire forces, uh, it's routine in the fire business. If you get a really big fire, like a conflagration, you know, multiple buildings or what have you, to call for help. There, there's a whole alarm, and after the first alarm, you automatically start calling in help. It's called, on the fire department, it's called a run car. Typically speaking, the difference between once you get to uh, there's a first alarm, there's a working fire, and there's a second alarm. By the time you get second alarm, you typically have between five to six communities coming in, sending engine and ladder trucks. And of course, they're all coming through those two causeways. We actually, in our exemption case, we ran the fire department numbers about what it would take to get, uh, but it's part of the reason that we're here. We ran the numbers about what it would take travel time to get help from East Boston, Revere, and Chelsea to this building right here. No way. And it's not within standard. It is almost 200% out of the NFBA national recommended standard. Just if all the roads are working, and if everything works right, and the, tra and the traffic light. Imagine any one of those roads going out, you guys are in deep trouble. strictly by population, 9,000 or under. And if you don't comply with 9,000 residents or under, you're automatically locked in. And if you don't comply with 3A, you're not going to see any federal or state funding coming from your government. That's a false. Right. So, 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 let me just, uh, but I think I'm going to answer a couple of your questions. My, uh, no, here. my question is, why did our legislature go ahead and vote for the bill? Really good question. I think I it was in the heart of COVID. Why did you vote for uh, the tech? It wasn't there. We're definitely backtracking as a state is great to resolve. This one in the July. I knew the baby that died. I just want to say that our first responders did everything they possibly could. No, I'm just saying that. No, I'm just. All at risk. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. Okay. But I'm saying they did everything they could. And you push all of these people with no head count in each unit. God knows about the fires. God knows right. about what's going to happen. Right. God knows what's going to go on in the store, whatever. What if something happens and they can't get to us? That's why I'm going to go So, fire rest now. Emergency yeah. station down on here. Why do we island. have the police chief here, the fire chief? Yeah, and everybody arguing for us against this because of our own we won't do it. So one of the questions that was asked, you know, was why did I vote for it? I wasn't in the legislature when this passed. So let's be crystal clear. It, it was voted three years ago before I ever became a state rep. Bob DeLeo resigned from the House of Representatives. There was a vacancy in the House. There was a special election in March. The law got passed in the wee hours of the morning, I believe five in the morning. On July 31st, the, the law got passed. No, no, Doc, no, that's different. No, that's different, Doc. That's, 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 that's a different bill. The, wrong law, Doc. the law we're here for is about 3A, which was passed in January of 2021. Correct. Speaker DeLeo was gone. 
I didn't take off until yes, April right. 7th of 2021. This is about the affordable the housing law that you're talking about, it's crystal clear. The grants, right that, the grants that a city or town Dye loses for not complying with free aid are not, have nothing to do with the federal government. That's another inaccuracy. There are four, the, 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 the bill was written in the Senate. Our senator supported it at the time. Senator McCorry was a supporter of the bill. The senator. He, he, I mean, I wasn't the He presented it. He, he presented it. Sen senator Creighton. Senator Creighton from Lynn is the only one in the House or Senate that spoke on the bill and what it did. And free aid. That was discussed today at the SJC hearing. So. Well, this is uh, waiting for you to finish with affordable housing. Water graduation. In July. According to former uh, fire chief Paul Flanagan, when the evacuation plan is to shelter in place. Yeah. You can't leave this community and go into East Boston and think you're going to get a lighter traffic pattern. You know what I mean? So it's shelter in place is what we have. Listen, there's so many moving parts in this that's even worse than 3A. You may or may not know this. Some of you do because I've talked to you about it. Um, the city of Boston has proposed, the mayor Wu has proposed to make Bennington Street each way, one lane. Yeah. They want to get permanent bike lanes so yeah. that Bennington Street would be one lane. Myself and Rep. Janino, where Bennington Street goes into Revere, that's my district. Rep. Janino and I had a meeting with Mascot. We said, this is absurd. Has anybody talked to Winthrop about this? I said, why would we do that? It's in Boston. I said, because it's an evacuation route from Logan Airport, number one. A sign say right on the road. Number two, you're going to endanger the lives of people leaving Winthrop and that live in Winthrop, and frankly, in the Revere side um, over there as well. And so. Adrian Madaro has come out against it. I feel confident that that's going to stop there. So there's so many different parts, but we had to talk about 3A. You know, Ms. D'Onofrio is confused. She's talking about the Housing, the uh, Affordable Homes Act, which was passed in July, which has a whole bunch of different things that are bad that I was opposed to. But, but the 3A law, which I'm opposed to, and I would have voted against if I was there, I was at the SJC this morning to watch the argument in person. It's all well, it's 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 I want to know if there are any exemptions. If, if, all right, if you take a vaccine, is there any exemption for people who are not vaccinated? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you get you. No, you can't. I'm, I'm, you know, yeah, we have a thing called the Massachusetts Tort Claims Act, which passed in 1981, which which waived, the state waived its sovereign immunity uh, in a limited capacity because of a case out of Wake, the town of Weir. And in that case, it's, I mean, I'm giving you a far more off, but the Supreme Judicial Court of the Commonwealth said that in the town of Weir case that if the Commonwealth doesn't voluntarily abrogate its sovereign immunity, which is the right not to be sued in its own courts that the, the court is going to throw out sovereign immunity. So they passed the Tort Claims Act. And one of the things the Tort Claims Act in Section 10J has a list of exemptions. It says you can't sue the Commonwealth and nor its municipalities for discretionary functions. And one of the things that's providing public safety is a discretionary function, right or wrong. Uh, and that's been the law since the common law um, in Massachusetts prior to our state constitution. Yeah. So, but again, that's a far afield from, from this issue. But, yes, Skip. I don't want to keep interrupting. But where did this all start? Well, let me finish. Where did this 3A all come from? The pounds of beef? Where did it all, it had to start somewhere. And who's behind all this? Yeah, we've said for where, the Who started it all? Set, set and and MAPC has been playing around with the development of transit-oriented development, or housing, since at least 2016. Who was it? MAPC is the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. It's a state-funded think tank and it, that, that, that has districts. And every district has one. And they all decided there? More or less. It's been well, kicked around. Who the be the I mean, the guys are the behind all this bullshit. There's got to be a group. MAPC is the think tank that said this is a great idea and the legislature should have it. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, it's a committee, and every town has a representative. Your town has a representative on MAPC's government board. Self-appointed. Self-appointed. Um, hey, Diana, in any case, Diana, uh, really quick. So, yes. I, I, Vasily Malios, um, just want to give everybody a heads up. So, we have reached out to the town council many months ago. Cheryl Howard had message, had emailed them several times, asking that our chief of police, chief of fire, DPW, all our head of each department to speak about this. We've asked. On we've, our behalf. We've asked several times on everybody that's against this. 
and we have, we have not heard back. We put it out there. We put every possible solution out to the town council. We've asked them to support our exemption. We've, we've been very fortunate to have Councillor Costigan and DeMarco sign, sign on in supporting us. Anybody else on that? Quite a few. Um, and then we've also had other elected, elected past and current officials that have signed on to it as well to show our support. So we have reached out. We've asked for those, those head of departments to speak up and tell us what their, uh, what their impact to their departments would be and also what to the town. We've been very fortunate because we've had meetings, uh, for example, our finance commission. They had asked some really great questions how it would impact their departments financially. Um, and if you had seen it on our Winthrop Says No to 3A Facebook page, we shared some of those clips. Our chief of police, but our fire chief brought up some excellent points as to why this would impact us. So we have, we have reached out. And we put it in the town council stand at this point to get these people in front of our community to share this information. So just want to, I just want to clarify that. Say that again. Say it again. That's what's on the block. That's the worst. So, so, so just back to the Yep. Yep. Anybody has been calling? Try to rent a house, even if it has five bedrooms, and you put more than four people on the lease. They put together either the back door to do a second lease or whatever. Right. How come all of a sudden? And, and back in the day, Winthrop was a big community to have flight attendants stay, mm -hmm. and they got shut off because these people that were literally just laying their heads down and, and taking off were told no more than four people allowed um, per per unit. How, how did we? kind of flip the switch on that, especially, we haven't fully flipped it, mm -hmm. I, I have people out in Western Mass that go to college, and that's still the, the law. Those yeah. restrictions are part of the zoning code, and they're individually made by each city and town. So Winfield is old for Seth and Winthrop, Chelsea is old for Seth and Revere, and the problem with 3A is that it's an exception <laughs> to your zoning code. Mm -hmm. It's designed yeah. to get rid of all yeah. those rules. And to your point, though, um, the, this type of housing, I mean, this is, they're very adamant about the new <coughs> occupancy limit, right? So, um, you know, the, this type of change uh, or of housing will be a change to a bedroom, the bedroom scenario. Renting by the room, roommates, pooling vouchers, multiple house, households sharing a single uh, apartment. This is the, it, the enriching of lamp. Right? And it's the lowering the quality of life for everybody. It's definitely akin to the late 1800s tenements, which they're bringing back now because they realize that it's a way to maximize rents. So they found a, a, a new way to do that. And, and just keep in mind that, you know, who's backing this? The real estate lobby is huge. They have a lot of power. And it's not just, you know, it's not just one type of um, entity. It's, you know, Builders, developers, lawyers, real estate agents, property managers, banks, Wall Street. I mean, Look the whole like ecosystem. Suffolk Downs. Suffolk Downs. Well, we went to all those beginning meetings. All of a sudden, everything has changed. Yep. Everything has been changed around. How many hands got fed that way? Totally. So, so, so back to why why Winthrop deserves an exemption. Um, so we talked about we talked about our extreme density. Um, I'd also, you know. Like just point out that this this calculation by the EOHLC was a whoops. It was an accident. It was, this is this is a lot that was slapped together, and it was done so very quickly in order to just like push it through. But but essentially, what's happened as a result is that those towns that have the the biggest burden already in terms of density are getting nailed, nailed. Okay, when there is the smallest city in Massachusetts. By the way, if you look up the smallest city in Massachusetts, it will come up with Chelsea, which is 1.8 square miles. And right under that, it will say, Winthrop is 1.6 square miles. I don't know how that happened. That's pretty odd. And we are, but we are the smallest city in Massachusetts, okay? Our density is, uh, is, is, is more so than, than our exempt neighbor, which is uh, uh, East Boston, which I guess is on the next uh, slide. But if you look at these other towns, 
that have less people. So this is the population, and then this is the um, square miles and acreage, right? You can see, um, so Luxembourg, uh, sorry, Lunenburg, thank you, uh, is 27.7 square miles. We're 1.6. They have a population of 11.6 57 um, people. We have 18,510, probably more than that, but that's 2022. And, and, um, and we have to zone for 882 units, and they have to zone for 240. They have more space, less people, and they have to zone for more, or sorry, less units. And the reason for that is because they are considered an adjacent small town. And I know that a lot of people in this room understand that our town manager, Sign, but he did, <laughs> okay. But he also did, I guess, attempt at one point, I think, to try to ask why we weren't a small town, right? We're the small city in, in uh, Massachusetts. Why aren't we a small town? The reason for that is because we have too many people. Correct. We have too many people. For sale signs, everybody. Right. For sale. So, so it's just more evidence that this thing was slapped together. In order to be a small town uh, under 3A, you need to have, you need to be eligible for the Grow Your Town grant. So that's what I'm calling it, but that's what it is. Uh, and, they, and, and the reason for that is they, they took the um, requirements for the Grow Your Town grant and they just slapped it on here. And they said, uh, you've got to have less than 100 acres of developable, developable land and a density of less than 500 people per square mile or a population of not more than 7,000 year-round residents. Well, we don't have that stuff because like, we're, we've got a lot of people and they live here all the time and we're tiny. But unfortunately, that means that we're not a small town and we have to zone for 10% of our existing housing stock unlike small towns, which have to zone for 5% of their existing housing stock with no minimum acreage. So we have to give them 12 acres, uh, unlike the rest of the small towns, but there's a question. Does this, does this plan contain the tenant houses on the acquisition devalue or increase the value of the property? Oh, uh, so really good question. Um, there's zero, so, this idea of densification means that, you know, think of New York, think of LA, think of Boston, right? Where you see density, generally speaking, you're gonna see more expensive places to live. Mm -hmm. There is a caveat to that in that there are some impoverished areas that, um, that some different um, metrics have been, uh, circumstances have been introduced that offset that, but generally speaking, where you see higher density, you see more expensive units, and it's because of the things I just said. There's this idea of co-living, um, getting rid of um, uh, common areas, uh, charging by the head, charging by the bedroom, um, and it allows you to maximize, as a developer or anyone that's interested in doing something like this, your profit merchants. So when they're this saying this affordable this housing, they're targeting that in their ad. Is the white house going to be worth more or less money on the average? It's going to be worth more. So, so, <laughs> well, well, so, so, so here's the thing. Um, so here's the thing. If you have, if you have a, if you have one house on an, let's say, an eighth of an acre, right? Um, the way you maximize the profits, according to the people that are pushing this, on that eighth of an acre is you put as many units on there as you can. Um, what happens if you put something like this in a single family residential area is that those developers give, you know, they've given, they've been given tools and they've lobbied for this. Are looking at the MAPC 3A suitability map, and they know when you bought the property, how much you bought it for, how long you've lived there, what the residential capacity is, what the development feasibility is on that land, and they will go and knock on the doors. And whoever sells first, they will they will go with that person, and then it will decrease. 
Accordingly, as the neighbors see their And Diana, may I interject on may I just interject change? on this yeah. on this part? Because this definitely relates um, this relates to Milton. Um, we <clears throat> I have family in Milton and through the 3A, just different correspondence with people in Milton. I can absolutely tell you, it was in the paper, but I can tell you firsthand, when this was happening in Milton, people in East Milton had developers coming to their doors, asking them to sell, saying, your market value is, let's say, a million five. We'll pay you 2.25 or 2.5 million in cash. No home inspection. No nothing. Here's the money, get out. So believe me, this idea when people want to say that people aren't coming to these communities that are, you know, in, in the 177, which Winthrop unfortunately is, it's been proven in Milton. People were coming to their doors, happily asking to buy their properties. That's not fallacy. That's not conspiracy. It's factual. They did it in Revere. To put it another way, the opportunity zones. So how does that affect the opportunity zones? Uh, those are a separate scheme, which are not in the game, but similar. Dens density is a supercharger. If you think about it, you've all seen, at least in the movies, rich farms, and you all know poor farms too. And you all know rich luxury downtown units like the new, the new condos in the Seaport District in Boston. And you also know poor urban blighted areas. Density supercharges whatever's happening to your community. In most cases, it makes everything more expensive. But if it's going to get worse, it's going to make it go way worse. It's going to make it go way worse faster. Kind of like what happened in Detroit. Yep, exactly. And I was actually down uh, on the Seaport at Medi uh, you have a date night, me and my husband the other night. And we saw, we looked up the apartments that are around us as we walked back to our car, which is all, um, in that same area, and had never seen this building before. And anyone want to take a guess what they're charging for between a studio and a three bedroom on the waterfront uh, in East Boston? Right now. One, one, five. What? Uh, for for rent, for rent. Oh, $5,000 for the studios. Four. Four. Oh, for, for the studios? Potentially. Yeah. What about the three bedrooms? Uh, 20000 How much? Twenty. No. You're not. Not $9,200 a month. Yeah. So, to Michael's point. What, what did you say? Yeah, it's $100,000 a year. Exactly right. All right, so so quickly, I, we do have a lot to get. Oh, one second, Carol. Uh, Wait, so just, just a minute. Here's who's going to lose. If you're living next door to the person that sells out and 16 units is going in there, your property isn't going to be worth more. It's going to be far less because no one's going to want to live next door to that kind of a building. Also, what's failed to be recognized is developers are winning. This phrase, as of right, really means that we are relinquishing zones to the state. In perpetuity, the state will have control of that zone, and you will not be protected of any of your local rights or protections. Furthermore, if they build in those zones, that developer, as of right, does not have to go through any local zoning hearings, processes, no special waivers, no special permitting, no discretionary approval by the local committees. This is a disaster in every regard. As a butters, you have no right to what that person is doing next door to you. Right now, under the local zoning laws, you can object to what's going on. Under 3A, abutters have no rights. And the development, it's all in their hands. This is a field day for those developers without any controls. That's like what they were trying to do on Shore Drive a few years ago. They were trying to put a 30-unit uh, apartment building on Shore Drive. And the neighbor said, uh-uh, there's no parking, there's, there's no availabilities, and where, where are people supposed to go? Yeah, exactly right. And, and, and we fought it and we won. Yeah, Now, exactly. this is a bigger fight, and we need to fight harder. And you have the opportunity to go to those hearings exactly. under uh, you know, our existing zoning laws, which zoning is inherently local. I mean, we know what's best here, what works. Um, but this is by right, you don't get that opportunity. Setbacks and 
What's on the front? Uh, Not just, only just, these nine states. It's Why not it's a different law. It's a different law. It's a different law. So, so just quickly, why else do we deserve an exemption? Then we'll move on to, to another topic here. Um, exemption rationale. So we have massive hardship, right? We've got the uh, MWRA. We've got Massport. What the, turns out is an environmental justice community, which means you can't place additional burden on Winthrop. Um, I did not know that before this journey started, but that's really important to understand. Also, our less dense neighbor, East Boston, which is where Lydia Edwards lives, is exempt from 3A. Uh, East Boston has a population density of 9,241 people. We have a population density of 11,569 people. We don't have any train stations. East Boston has five train stations. This is an MBTA. Pardon? Good question, because MB, because um, Boston is actually included in the definition of MBTA communities under MGL Chapter 161A. It is right next to Milton. So um, they're just sort of saying they're exempt. Uh, super interesting. Uh, in addition, uh, last point I'll make here on our exemption, Winthrop already gets, this is the paper trail uh, argument, a, a density uh, discount for 40B. Who here knows what 40B is? Okay, got a couple. So 40B says that you have to maintain in your town a certain uh, level of subsidized housing. If you don't, a 40B developer or developer can come in and supersede your zoning laws is similar to 3A but different in a very important way. Superseder zoning laws and put up some monstrosity that has, you know, maybe something like 3A packed with, you know, multi-bedrooms, what, what have you. But the idea is that 40B is geared towards actual affordable housing. So 40B, it says that um, if you don't maintain a certain percentage of affordable housing in your town, then a developer can come in and put um, something up so long as they have at least, I think, 25% affordable units in there. The definition of affordability under 40B is for people who make 80% of the area median income or below. The definition of affordability, if you if your town so chooses to, um, to require that any 3A developer include the 10% possible affordable housing in their 3A unit thing, uh, the definition of 3A is for people making 80% of the area median income or above. In Winthrop, that's $70,000. So you have to make $70,000 a year in order to qualify for the affordable housing in an A3A apartment. So we've got 40B on one side, which is for affordable housing, it doesn't affect us unless we dip under a certain level, and then you got four, and then you got section uh, chapter 40, 40A, 3A on the other side, which says you got to make a bunch of money in order to, to qualify for these apartments. So, so just one thing I'll, I'll get to here. So, so the reason that I've included this, and maybe Michael can hit on the Kansas statu statutory construction why we why we have to read these things together, is because it turns out that Winthrop get the tiny town discount for 40B. Um, so 40B has three ways of, of getting safe harbor. Um, you can get safe harbor from 40B if you're one of these towns that has, has been designated to maintain a 10% of, uh, of affordable housing in your town or above. You can get safe harbor from 40B if you got nailed because you didn't do that and then somebody came in and built some stupid thing that you hate but it's for two years, it gives you a safe harbor from 40B. Or, or, and this is where we come in, and I, and I believe we're the only town in the Commonwealth that has this. You have safe harbor from 40B, one, per, one and a half percent of your land that's zoned, residential, commercial, or industrial, is zoned, it, it's subsidized. So how do we know that we have that wealth in, 2002. Um, show of hands, how many people in this room have heard of the uh, Dick Dimes Dave Hubbard study? Oh, nice. Okay. So 
So, so Dick, Dick Dimes, Dave Hubbard, uh, passionate about Winthrop, they sat down when there was a proposal in front of Winthrop um, uh, by a developer who was represented by attorney Cipolletta, who's now a Ware Town attorney, <laughs> came in and said, we're gonna put up some stupid thing uh, at Winthrop Hospital. So Dick Dimes and Dave Hubbard sat down and they said, for, I don't know, six months or I don't, I don't know how long it took. And they sat down and they went through this very tedious calculation to figure out uh, whether Winthrop qualified for this very unique safe harbor. This is a type of safe harbor where you don't have to like send in your stuff every year. You only have to do something, a study like this, if somebody comes to you and says, we're gonna put up some 40B something in your, in your town. So they sat down and they put this it painstakingly, every single unit here in this town, and they figured out not only do we have 1.5% of subsidized uh, that are of our land that that is zoned residential, commercial, industrial. That's subsidized. We actually have four point four percent, and this is only available to the very very densest of towns. Um, can, you, can you just elaborate a little? Because if you notice in the writing that they say as of two twenty, the censor ship in Winthrop was the determining factor, and if you notice the second sentence down there. Something about it says uh, utilities or I can't read it. Statutory minimum. So, so minimum for affordable housing. Yep. Every single time we discuss this combination, if you will, sir representative, the combination thereof, when the bottom line is approached, it is affordable housing and it is also massive construction. Wow. Small parcels of land. Daddy, you're there absolutely can't right. Build this way, go up. Yep, absolutely right. But in this case, it actually works to our advantage because 40B is something we actually comply with in a very, very unique way that is only available to the most dense community. So then we might be the only community that has this thing. So, so the the idea is that you know we have a paper trail of getting uh, a break, a break. From stuff like this, a, uh, a break. Oh, a break. Um, um, by, by way of 40B. We're a city, though, not a town. We are a city. That's yeah. correct. A city known as the town. So, exactly. So, just to round off the um, the exemption uh, discussion, um, uh, Winthrop has filed an exemption case. It's a complaint for administrative review. Uh, by Winthrop says no uh, to three committee versus executive. Office of Housing and Livable Communities it was amended on uh, September 22, and I, and I think today again. Um, the timing of this is uh, we've right. we've given the other side a an extension to respond. The other side is Eric Haskell. If you watch the Milton case today, that's who's going against us in our exemption case. So it's the Attorney General's office, um, represented by Eric Haskell, um, who are. Uh, the plaintiffs in this case, and um, we definitely owe like a debt of massive gratitude for just applause as you will please. Patrick Costigan, Rob DeMarco, Dr. Carol Pachella, Fred Bagley, Gus Martucci, Peter Gill, Larry Powers, Paul Verone, Maggie Riley, and the Winthrop Says No Committee. Thank you, thank you so much for, for supporting Winthrop. to neighbors and friends, explaining to them the significance of this bill, it should not be on the ballot. It should not be anywhere around Winthrop. But go out and Agreed. talk about it. Give Agreed. It Sorry, thank you. You're absolutely right. And, and just one more point I'll make about the exception, and then, and then I'll give you. Um, if we're successful in our density argument, there are 105 other towns and cities that, according to our regulations do meet or exceed the density that's required by 3A. So there's a really good chance we could be a, um, a safe harbor here in Winthrop as a result of our efforts, much like the one was today. Just a simple question. I just want to know what an environmental, I forgot what the phrase was now, yeah. environmental justice yep. community or something? No. Really good question. So you can become an environmental justice community a number of ways. You have to have a certain um, percentage of um, diversity, you ha um, in our case, we're just environmentally compromised.
Yeah. It's, it's as simple as that. What is the best solution that you can come up with, being a lawyer or whatever? If you had to make a recommendation to us, what is the best way to try and shut this down and stop it from getting this morning, between 9 and 10 o'clock in the morning, we, we heard the preliminary answer. As the SJC heard the argument, there were a lot of great questions. You, you can't always read what a court's going to do by its questions, but uh, I thought uh, Justice Wojciech Hohen, her comments were great when she said, aren't you going right to the right to franchise? The, the select board in Milton passed a 3A compliant plan. People exercised their, their constitutional right under their charter to put it on the ballot, and the people voted not to comply. Right. And she's saying, well, aren't you effectively asking us to take away the citizens' right to vote on exactly. this? And it was phenomenal. Um, so I think in a whole bunch of the questions, there was one justice that clearly supported 3A you know, by his questions. But the rest of them, I thought there were a lot of really good questions about you know, there's a whole provision in state law called 30A, which is when, when a state agency wants to pass a regulation, they have to go through a certain process and they have to do certain things. So the attorney general's, uh, uh, the assistant attorney general argued, well, the only thing we didn't do under 30A, we did, these are guidelines, they're not regulations. The legislature in its wisdom chose the word guidelines. They didn't say regulations. And therefore, these are different. They don't have to comply with 30A. But even if we did have to comply with 30A, the only thing we didn't do was a small business uh, uh, fiscal assessment. And then Justice uh, Wendell went right at him and said, well, that's not correct. What you said in your opening brief was you didn't publish this in the Massachusetts Register. You didn't, um, there were a whole series of steps that they didn't comply with. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's not much we can do right now other than there is this talk of a ballot question uh, at the local level, similar to what Milton did. Um, we're postured a little bit differently in that, in that realm. I'm happy to speak about that. We may actually disagree on How about that. educating the um, community? So, uh, <laughs> but, but it is the law of the Commonwealth right now, until the SJC rules otherwise, that in, in nobody has contested the Commonwealth's right to pass this law before the SJC. What they argued was, number one, the Attorney General doesn't have the right to sue because the legislature didn't give her the right to sue for, to enforce this law. Number two, the legislature in its wisdom passed, when they originally passed 3A, there were three grant programs that you would lose if you chose not to comply. Three years later, it was amended to add a fourth. So the attorney for Milton said, look, the legislature knew what it was doing. If it wanted to add 14 grant programs, right. it would have said that. If it wanted to give the attorney general the authority to, to sue, they would have done that, but they did not. And so effectively, with, with the, the argument to Milton, uh, to the SJC was, Milton should be allowed to say, we're not gonna comply, and if we don't, we'll accept the penalty, which is the loss of these four grants, but nothing more. And so that's where, that's where we're at, absent getting 177 other communities, or 176 other communities to go out and put a ballot question on to repeal 3A as a matter of state law. There's nothing you can do here or we can do at the local level to repeal 3A. It's the law of the Commonwealth. You know, I filed an amendment to exempt Winthrop when we did the budget debate. It got rejected. Um, they made it crystal clear. The speaker has said, we're not gonna have any changes as long as I'm speaker. He supports it. He believes it's the right thing to do. The governor and her team believe it's the right thing to do. And I, I said before, I think even a worse threat to Winthrop than 3A is in the housing bill that Dottie was referencing uh, that was passed in July. There was a provision in there which I think would be far more detrimental, which is every single family home in the entire Commonwealth by right can put a accessory dwelling unit in their home by right. In the home. And if you're in 177 uh, member MBJ Communities Act uh, zones, there's no parking requirement. Mm -hmm. And it's up to 900 square feet or 50% of the size of your home. You can do it by right. And neither own it. Here's the kicker. Neither unit has to be owner occupied. Oh. And so what, that's gonna do, and so, so what that's going to do is that's going to wind up, you know, jacking up prices as private companies come in and buy single family homes, put in a, an accessory dwelling unit of 900 oh, yeah. square feet and turn around and rent them out. They get to claim depreciation. There's a whole bunch of different reasons why they can afford to then pay more yeah. than you might if you were looking to buy a house in the town. Well, maybe the transcript yeah. can... Yeah, and I, if you're here and now, put this in the paper and make everybody aware of 
all these negative things coming down. Everybody yeah, and I just want to make one, like, just just one quick clarification. I think that the exemption that was for the house, right, was for folks that complied with 40B to be exempt from three from three. It wasn't specifically for Winthrop. We have a massive amount. I filed one to say if you were compliant with 40 40B, right, be exempt. And the reason was because of the discussions regarding right. Winthrop's uh, Right, but well, we, we, like, just to, just to point on that inner point, uh, we do comply with 40, 40B in a very, very unique way, um, which, is, which is lends to to our other points. And I, and I think uh, the fact that we were assigned the Milton attorney uh, speaks volumes. Hi, Kathleen Capuccio. Um, I am a member of the NOAA 3A committee, and I just want to truly thank, and I know this is not a political event, um, but when you are a politician, it's really hard, probably, to come out and, you know, go against the majority of, you know, your colleagues in the Senate and in the House, and, sorry, Rep Turco is a gem for Winthrop. with someone about, I don't know, it was maybe a couple months ago, was, again, I, I mean, I've been involved in a political family, or not a political family, activists, um, and someone was talking to me about, well, you know, when you're a politician, and you want to really affect change, you have to think about, when you're in that environment, I didn't think about it, what committees you actually might get appointed to by the people that are in charge. So bucking the system doesn't maybe work well when you're a politician or when you're you know, an elected official. I don't agree with Jeff Turco on everything. He knows that. I can tell you when it came to not just 3A, when it comes to the MVP grant that Winthrop was denied for the Morton Street flooding, our biggest advocate is this man right here. Jeff constantly goes to bat for Winthrop on every level. Jeff constantly shows up. Jeff is true to his word. Jeff is one of the finest men, and I can say a dear friend, and back in the day, we were a little bit of adversaries. Um, so just please, and I'm not saying people haven't, I thank you, my friend, for being here tonight. I thank you for being at the recovery event the other night. I thank you for always showing up for Winthrop, not just for a photo op, because you care, you love this community, and I tell you, we are grateful for your leadership and most of all for me, I'm grateful for your humanity and the community member you are. So just thank you for being here because you didn't need to. You didn't need to answer questions and you did. You are the embodiment of leadership. And I thank you. And, and Jeff really does love, love what they're uh, uh, let's just, can we save it to the end because we're, we're running out of time. Yeah. I just want to make sure we get to the, uh, okay, really quick, Diane, really quick, because I, w I definitely want to get to the petition. I think the people are here. Oh, yeah, can you just summarize what we've been doing? Yes, okay, good. And where are you at today? Yes, absolutely. Um, so quickly, uh, the, the Citizens Initiative petition, this is, this is the uh, sort of, um, the, the controversy I think that's happening right now and what we have to actually discuss as a community in the event that we have time, otherwise it's gonna be over email. Um, the whole idea of the Citizens Initiative Petition is to let the people vote. And the idea and the reason that we want the people to vote is because it's too big for nine people, three of whom are conflicted, okay? This impacts our quality of life, our education system, our property values, our dollars, our rights. Uh, the council can vote alongside us. And we 
We've got one that works for Mastod, one whose son that works for Mastod, one who has a property for sale in a proposed zone. Um, the town is already under tremendous strain, um, etc. cetera, blah, blah, blah. All right, I just wanna make sure we get to all the things. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, where does this come from? Citizens Initiative Petitions um, we are, Massachusetts is one of 26 uh, states in the nation that allows citizens to directly legislate via citizens' initiative petition. Um, the federal law, just this is where it comes from, um, gives us the right, under the First Amendment, the right to assemble, right? The right to free speech. Uh, under state law, I mentioned one of 26 uh, have, have, states have this option. And our Winthrop Charter, Section 8.5 spells out how we do this. Here's Section 8.5 of the Winthrop Town Charter. All the steps that we need to do, and we have followed them to the letter, and Kathleen and I have mail, certified, mailed ourselves as the top five members of, uh, on, on, on the petition committee. We certified, mailed ourselves uh, copies of the appeal that we filed recently, but I'll get to that. Commencement, referral to the town attorney, submission to the clerk, action on petitions, what's allowable. Then you go to supplement our petitions, if that doesn't work, it's gotta be published, it has to be in the form of a question, and then the time of taking effect means that if you've gone through all that stuff and it got to the ballot and people voted in the majority in the affirmative on, on the question that you put there, it becomes law, just like that. So why did they void it? Good question. Here's the story. We had two petitions. Yep. Uh, number one, only got to 885B. Okay? Number one said there shall be no further over. Except for purposes of sanitation, sewer, water, environmental purposes, especially utilities. Yes. There shall be no transit oriented zoning districts, and that there shall be no zoning districts complying with the EUHLC. Uh, check section 3A guidelines is currently in effect, and it was stopped by the town attorney. Yes, uh, we got to commencement. That's we needed 50 citizen signatures and 10 committee members. We got like 90, um, and then it goes to referral to the town lawyer. The town lawyer refer looks at it for form and prohibited topics. That's where he said this is prohibited. We went. He. Stop the thing from happening, not allowed to happen. But we did go to the court and we said we need an emergency order to stop him from stopping us. Uh, they denied us, they said it's not really a repair of harm because you could do a referendum, so you got it wrong, so we're appealing it. But, but, thanks to the fortitude of certain citizens of our town, we had a backup plan and we put in position number two, which just says let the people vote. You can read it yourself, but that's all it says, okay? Commencement, we started, we started over. Commencement, 50 citizens, 10, 10 community members, we got actually 110. Uh, referral to the town attorney, he said, yes, fine, go forward under the charter, and then when it gets to the town council, if you are lucky enough to get 5% of the town to, 5% of the registered voters to sign this thing, it will go to the town, town um, council, and they can either adopt, adopt the language as written, they can adopt a measure in lieu of it, which is a rejection, or they can reject the thing entirely. And he wrote that in his exception and you know, a statement of, that this is a lawful petition. So we went out and we got 5% of the voters, and we turned that in, and it was 871 eight, Thank you, Michael. Uh, then, after that, it goes to the town council. The town council has those three options that I just said, but here's where it got Weird, super weird. So, uh, so the 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 Friday or Thursday before that town council meeting, which was meant to be on the fourth uh, of September, the town lawyer uh, inserted a bunch of stuff um, uh, of what the town council could do with it, not accept it, not put a measure in, in, in lieu of it and not reject it. It was, uh, this is a zoning issue, it has to go to the planning board for a full hearing, then it has to go to town council for, for a full hearing, and then it has to go back to the town council for a two-thirds vote, which is not actually even in, or related to 3A anymore, and that 3A says uh, simple majority. That's when we filed, 
I'll, I'll share my screenshots, but basically we said you can't do that. Go ahead, Michael. Okay. So after we said you can't do that, we, we assumed that because I did something other than one of the three options, we must have been a rejection. So we went out and pointed to signatures. More than a thousand of you signed. That's a hell of a lot of signatures in a small town, by the way. Huge. After a thousand, the town clerk sent it back with a big X on it, says, no one void, premature, I'm not going to count it. It's not going to certify. So we decided to appeal to the Board of Registrars of Voters. For those of you who know, they're the local election officials. They actually supervise everything to do with elections, Certifi certification for um, uh, public candidates for office. They do with ballot questions. If you go to cast your vote, you're not sure, the people who hold the hearing are the Board of Registrars. And the town attorney took the position that the Board of Registrars had no jurisdiction. Fortunately, some of them were trying to disagree with us, or trying to disagree with the town attorney and at least let us have a hearing. We were actually going to try and have a hearing. And the town clerk, after bouncing our signatures, uh, got an opinion from the town attorney that says that they had no jurisdiction, so she wasn't going to let them hold a hearing on public property. Huh. Anyway, this is a public board. They can't meet in a, in a public room in town hall, or the, or the library, or the senior center. So then we tried to secure the Point Shirley Association to have our own hearing, because it's a board of registrars, and they can meet anywhere in the town they want, schools, or what have you. Uh, we were all sent down to do it here, and then the town clerk wouldn't post the notice, so it was a legal meeting, 48 hours in advance. And then apparently, among the way, uh, someone, I'm sure if, the, if it's a town clerk or the town attorney, threatened to fire a majority of the board of registrars if they dared to even have a meeting where they would listen to us. And of course, they want to do this four weeks before the general election, presidential general election, because that's a really good time to be firing election officials. Yeah. We've now amended our the, the suit not against the state for an exemption, but the suit against the town of Winthrop and its attorney seeking to add in the second uh, petition. And we're, we're in the process of organizing a date with the town attorney right now for an emergency hearing. We're hoping, we're still hoping to try and get a local ballot produced for the November 3rd election. For those of you who come to the polls, in the event that it doesn't work, we're still hoping that the Superior Court will order something in the near future. Uh, at the moment, it looks like Thursday is going to be the best of moment, but I know Attorney Cipolletta has promised me by email in the last 15 minutes to get back to me tomorrow morning. And his attorney has COVID. So excuse, me. Uh, excuse me. You're talking about submitting and wanting it to go to the people for a vote. I'm going to share with you two different occasions. The last one being my committee, we fought the marijuana question. Now, if you remember Massachusetts State passed the marijuana, and if you read that question, no meant yes, and yes meant no. Okay, wait. When they did Winthrop, no meant yes, and under um, the previous chair of the board, that no meant yes, and yes meant no on the marijuana question. I went to the town manager, and I said, you've got two things. I called the library, the law library, into Boston. They worked with me very closely. I turned around and I said, you've got two issues. You either write it properly and legally for the people to make a clean, clear decision, or I go to the press and I expose everything. Yep. The town manager at the time was very, very nice, and he wanted it clear, too, because he had had it right up to his neck with a lot of the issues going on in the political background of yeah. Metro. Yeah, so that is a really good point. Be careful of the wording on the vote. Uh, first of all, um, as a, uh, um, pursuant to the steps that we took in chapter 8.5, one of them is for the committee to put out the language that will be on the ballot. Um, it, of course, is up to the town lawyer to okay uh, that language, but we have put it in the language as written, and we have said, you know, question, shall the measure which is proposed by the initiative take effect, the initiative petition take effect, and it is exactly what is in the petition, does the, one, one moment, do the people decide or do the town, town council decide on 3A issues, yes or no. Uh, I will say to your point that uh, our town has a history of rebuffing, rebuking, putting off, um, sidelining, initiative petitions, and did so in 2019 with the Somerset. So those those um, those citizens put together an initiative petition. We found it. It was called Initiative Petition Number Two, ironically, just as ours was. Uh, and it in a town council meeting was was postponed indefinitely. 
And that's where it landed. And unfortunately for us, we are in a situation where um, citizens' uh, rights are not honored with respect to directly legislating via initiative petition. And that is what we are fighting against. They called, they called an attorney for me at the library in Boston, and they called me back. And they said, the one key element is you've got so much wording going on. At the end of that wording, put down the explanation. Yes means you do favorably want bingo. One sentence. Underneath the no, put the reason why in one sentence is the clarity. Because they will not stand there in the ballot box and read and read and read. And it's so, overwhelming. So, so where we stand today isn't even voter confusion. We asked to let you guys vote no. They wouldn't do that. So now we've asked that you guys should just be able to have a vote later on at some point. And they won't do that. They won't. Even though you've signed the signatures, they won't certify them. They. They is town hall, the town clerk, and the town attorney. And, and the last piece. No, Chris, Chris. The, la the last piece ahead of you is that the town council, if they wanted to let you have the vote, they don't have to wait for your signature. They actually can just get together with four or five of them and That's vote right. to put in the ballot themselves, and they have refused at every alternative. Yeah. Well, couple, but but I, I do want to address a, a couple of points in this referendum. First of all, and I know this will this will go um, against what some of us are talking about for now. I'm opposed to free aid. I think it's bad law. I think it's bad for Winthrop. I think it's bad for the Commonwealth. You know, I've said the way you're going to solve a housing crisis is by building high, the high-speed rail from east to west and use the land in Broomfield and Brookfield. And, well, there's plenty of land. We have many of the people in Western Mass. They're dying out here in Western Massachusetts. And all you got to do is look at a map of the congressional districts where the first congressional district literally runs from you know, Florida, Massachusetts, all the way across up until you know, East and Middlesex County because they don't have enough people out there. But that being said, respectfully, I can, you know, Cipolletta is right on the first one. If, if Winthrop, if I went and tried to put an initiative question on the ballot that said, Winthrop will not comply, we want the, we want the people of, of Winthrop to vote, that Winthrop will never comply with the Massachusetts lottery law, or Winthrop will never comply with the Commonwealth's law um, on firearms. Everybody would say, you can't, you can't do that. And so, the, because the law doesn't allow them, that, cities and towns don't have the right to elect not to comply with state law. So the first question, no, as a legal matter though, the attorney for the town is charged under the charter with saying, is this legal? And the, the answer to the first question is absolutely, it wouldn't be legal to say Winthrop will never comply. The difference from what Milton did was Milton people rejected a plan. They never said we'll never comply. They simply said we won't. We don't adopt this plan, but to adopt the law that well, says we'll never comply, yeah. it, it runs afoul of state law. Number two, well, on this one, that. we have a statewide yeah. initiative process in our state constitution, mm -hmm. and similar to the charter, the town charter. The state initiative process says you get ten signatures, you file your question to the attorney general, she reviews it for legal suitability, it comes back, you go out and you get 70,000 signatures, you submit it to the legislature, the legislature has six months to act. If it doesn't act at the end of the six months, then you go out, it's deemed a constructive denial. If it's approved or a modified one is approved, then the committee can make a decision that they like the modification. Then, once the six months is up, then at that point, the, attorney, uh, the Secretary of the Commonwealth issues new paperwork to say, go out and get your extra 30,000 signatures, right. now you go on the ballot. Respectfully, you did everything right. You don't get to declare, and I'm on your side. I signed that petition. No, I know, and I, and we, I do. But I we, do. No, well, just, yeah. we don't get to unilaterally declare that the council, they had 60 days to make a decision. We don't get to unilaterally declare, because they referred it to the planning board, that we and still have plenty of time on the 60 days, that that's a, that's a denial. So, and so I know we disagree on it, but I think the law is quite clear. Yeah, and, you know, I think you know, you're going to see that in the spirit of court. Diana, Diana, Diana. No, no, no. Like, just, 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 also, can we have a turning wall? Anyway, absolutely. Can we have, can we have it? Yeah. Again, this yeah, is, no. And this is where, again, I love Jeff Turco. Yeah, but this is where I really, sorry, I'm going to take a little freedom here. No, no. To have a turning wall to. Sorry, attorney, when I still refuse to call you Michael. To speak to <laughs> Mike, this. actually. I, Mike, sorry, I'm not going to call you. I'm going to call you attorney Walsh because you, you owe that. Attorney Walsh is not just an attorney. He is an expert in constitutional and municipal law. He has been before courts as a litigator, 
nonstop. So please, I, I just I, I ask you, please listen to Attorney Walsh right now when he addresses this, please. So with respect to Rep. Tarko, I disagree with you, but, but on a very specific point, the town charter says after you submit the first set of signatures, the town council has 30 days to act. Then it's got a separate provision which says if they don't do anything for 60 days, on the 60th day, that's an automatic denial. I think that's the way we read it. So our argument is, is that Mr. Uh, the, the town attorney, as well as the town council, have started to treat the second petition, which only says that you should have a vote on whatever the 3A plan is. They've decided it's a zoning amendment. There's nothing in the law that supports it's a zoning amendment. And the case on that is a case called Sprelgenhauser versus the town of West Barnstable. It's a mass appeals court from 2011. Uh, so it's not a zoning article, so it shouldn't have to run through the planning board and the hearing process for three weeks and all this. And the second argument is, is that even if it was a zoning article, that there's a, there's a series of cases that says that referendums aren't subject to 40A. It's a different way of making zoning. The, the, the SJC has been very specific about that. And so because of these two cases, one, it's not a zoning article, and two, even if it was, the zoning by initial ballot isn't subject to 40A. I think that the town attorney made a mistake, and so I advised Attorney Viennes to go ahead and start collecting the signatures, because even if we were wrong, the worst thing that happens is we collected the signatures too early. Yeah. 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 But the town yeah. clerk made a grave mistake because she wrote X across it and sent it back and said it was null and void. And there's nothing in the law that allows her to do that. Even if we were premature, all she has to do is stick to the board and make sure she sent it back, and that was an error. I think that was a plain legal error. And I think we will win on that particular point. Agreed. And I'd also, I'd also say. Attorney represent the people of women from the town of Good point. And I, and I also say, like, Obviously, this isn't a zoning issue. We're not saying residential A has to be residential B, or you can park over there now and not over here. This is who has the right to vote on something so very impacting on 18,500 residents, okay? It's not fair to have to, to allow a, a nine-member council, three of whom have massive open conflicts Okay, that directly touch their pocketbooks. Thank this you. is obvious. This stuff is obvious. Okay, there is so much to be lost here by not letting the people, and God knows, maybe people will vote yes. I don't know. But at the end of the day, it is the decision, the collective decision. And I'll be, I'll be perfectly honest, I did not vote for the recall. I didn't. I thought it was uh, ill-intended. I thought it was based on somebody's comment. But God, am I glad it is here now. And I am so glad that we have uh, a, a, a way to address people that are not representing our town. Um, and, and we have actions that we can take uh, because this is very important. I, I do feel like we are not being represented in this situation. I know we skirted past the, the whole situation entirely, entirely but, but I can tell you I was in this room when, when this happened and I can, I can tell you that when I saw the look on the counselor's uh, faces who, who are for us and represent their constituents, they were shocked that they didn't get a chance to speak or vote and that there was no vote. I, I was flabbergasted. I've never seen anything like this in my entire life. Um, certainly not in the charter that a town council president can unilaterally just push away a citizen's initiative petition that's backed by state law, by local law, by our constitution in Massachusetts and by our constitution in the United States. This is bizarre. Can I get away with it in Woodrow? Not today, that, sir. Not today. You can get away with what you let them get away with, period. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah. I've been here 80 years and I've seen it all. How does this affect the budget? Really good question. So, yep, no, that's a really good question. And my father's actually here in the audience and he's, he actually did a little research on what a new school would cost. So, uh, yes, agreed. Um, so we haven't seen a dime from the four grants that are in the three paragraph law for seven years. The last time we saw uh, any money from that was 
$2.38 million, and it was to pave over our town center, and that's when DeLeo was in, in the office. But if we were to allow something like this to take place, and again, our entire business district um, circles around the proposed zones, lots of unconstrained land, we definitely, I mean, we, will, we may be looking at a new school, and, and looking back at the number of students that we've, we've um, had come. Oh, no, zero. We, we don't get yeah. no, zero. Right. It's a no brainer. Why aren't we exempt? Yes, here, here. And I, and I will say that, um, that we absolutely deserve an exemption, that there is no financial benefit, and we can't even put affordable housing in these units, which actually puts us at risk for um, bumping us out of compliance with 40B. Um, the town council president has refused to uh, join our exemption, which is another problem. Not problem, but just um, no, observation. No. Uh, yes, yes. I would like to ask Representative Chirkoff, you know, we're concerned about complying and not complying. Isn't the bigger issue that the legislature has to tackle is this law is unconstitutional. It is being applied to people in zones that don't have the same rights as their neighbor two blocks away. Why isn't anyone tackling the unconstitutionality in changing this law? You cannot selectively cherry pick. This law applies to this person because they live in the zone. It doesn't apply to someone who's not going to get there. It's not going to be an unfair application of the law to select a group of people. And people in the middle are going to be divided. I'm going to lose my protection locally because I live in that zone. <laughs> well, and what I would say is that you know, the, uh, the unconstitutionality of the law was not in question this morning before the Supreme Judicial Court. So it was not raised by Milton, um, at least in the, in the argument, in the briefing that I read from, from uh, the lawyers from Milton, they didn't argue over the constitutionality of it. What I would say is every city and town in the Commonwealth has winter, we have all different zoning districts. Some districts allow single-family homes. Some districts allow multi-family homes. You could argue that if you live on the, on the line between the multi-family and the single-family, well, why am I being treated differently? Why can I only have a single-family and this person can have a two-family or three-family? Well, that's where the line is. Every cities and towns draw lines. And, but the Commonwealth under the, the state constitution, you know, writ large, the Commonwealth controls zoning, except, you know, they leave it the local zoning under the um, the local, the local amendment in the, in the late 60s. Um, but to the extent that the Commonwealth chooses to step in, like they did with 40 b you know, again, I don't like the law, but I don't think, I mean, it'll be interesting to see what legal arguments people make as to the constitutionality, but that hasn't been argued yet in the Milton case. I know there's some talk, yeah. about, there's some talk about doing that in federal court. I'm not sure what the federal constitutional right is. But yeah, and I was just, just a quick note about 40 b 40 b isn't uh, the state coming in and mucking up your zoning. 40 b is if you don't have enough affordable housing, they back, uh, one second, they back, um, you know, maybe, maybe, because we went in the, uh, with a possible situation, um, if it looks like a, a developer lost out on maybe they spent money on a study or plans or buying the land or what have you, you can you can foresee losses there. But that's a project by project basis. That's not the state coming in and zoning or mandating zoning in, in your. But, but it but it was the state overruling local zoning. I mean, it's, yes. There, however, there, there's, the, a, there, there's right. a housing appeals board at the state level. <laughs> That what they've done with 40B, you go before, instead of going to the planning board uh -huh. and, the, and the zoning board, you have one board that acts as the super board yeah. at the local level. You make your argument. If you're not satisfied as a developer, right, well, you, go you, to, you, go to, you go to a state board, yeah. and then the state board makes the final call. It clearly overrides, and it's been on the book for decades. Right. If, you you're, if you dip below the required level of subsidized housing under the law. Uh, yeah. Well, this is for Joe. Um, is it... Since they wrote the law such that it had a penalty for non-compliance, right. why can you not vote against not complying with the law? I agree, and I think that was part of the argument from Milton. Is the Milton lawyers are saying it said, well, the Milton lawyers said to the SGC, the legislature has chosen these four grant programs, right. and the people of Milton, you know, directly 
or through their representatives are allowed to make the decision, we're willing to give up access to these four grants. Right. You know, because we think it's so bad for our community. You know, and so that that was part of the argument of Milton. And frankly, I think it was very persuasive because again, Milton Way pointed out that when 3A originally passed in January 21, there were three grants that were specifically laid out in the law. A couple of years, two or three years later, they added the legislature added the Do, you, do you agree that people should now be, not now, but because of the way that the law is written, opt out of getting the four grants and simply vote to not comply? I signed the petition. I think, I think Pete Winthrop, first of all, I, I think we should be grateful to the council because there's nine members of the council and as I, you know, I haven't talked to every one of them, but just sort of trying to read the cards, there are one member refused, four members opposed, and four members in favor. We won. They need five votes to pass a 3A plan in the Winter Town Council, and they don't have five votes. It's a stalemate. Yeah, doesn't right, that, that, that. That's a win. They need five votes to pass a 3A compliant plan. Take the victory. So, you know? so, so yeah. now we go, if, and if we were to lose, and if, then we have the absolute right, nobody questions that we have the absolute right to then put anything the council affirmatively approves, we have the right to put on the ballot. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 like Milton yeah. did. Sorry, Jeff. But, but we won. Yes. We, we, no, I, I, sorry. I, I, I love Jeff. I, we disagree on the point. Um, that being said, the only fair way to resolve this is to uh, allow people to vote. I do want to give a shout out to Diane Sands because not only yes. was she helped, like, uh, really, uh, you know, a cost during signature collection, but because the town clerk uh, yanked or whomever not yanked down our our signs up at town hall, she went up and down Crest Ave and put more signs up, and she fell the other day and hurt her leg. And I just, I just cannot thank you enough, and you're just such a champion for Winthrop, and we love you so much. Talking about the um, suits on visuality. What about the rock boys? Yeah. I thought they were um, arguing that. <laughs> Can you do that to, to totally answer the question, I'm Mike Walsh from Linfield. I am representing the gentleman with the white shirts from Rockport who's challenging constitutionality on both the federal and state level. We think it is, but I should tell you that I'm in the minority. I, oh. I am swimming upstream. Representative Turco has actually given you a, a, a right, straight, true, run-of-the-mill, center, median strip illegal answer. Uh, my argument in the Rockport case, which is actually just coming up on appeal now, uh, and we're hoping to make some law with it, is that because uh, the cases say that zoning comes from two sources. There is your local power to zone under the Home Rule Amendment of the state constitution, and then there's the legislature's power to uh, zone under Article 60 of the amendments. Uh, and, and we're arguing that uh, because the legislature is, through 3A, trying to compel the town to use its zoning power, not the state using its own zoning power, the state zoning power has some different restrictions than local zoning power. For example, the state, the state zoning power under Article 60 isn't allowed to touch the vacant land. The regulation of vacant land or green spaces is entirely a local function. That, that can be done under Article 9 and cannot be done under Article 60. Um, so we're trying to argue that 3A is in effect an attempt to tell the towns that they have to pick up the pro uh, 3A sword and, and create transit-oriented development. Hmm. I have to tell you, the, the, the Salem Superior Court gave you exactly the same answer that Roturco did and said, see on appeal. Um, in terms of the federal constitutionality of it, this law is really strange in the sense that it unlocks zoning restrictions. Zoning, the history of zoning for a hundred years has been regulating for health or safety or aesthetic reasons to promote green space, to shut down density, to try and you know create parking spaces and other amenities. And this is the first time you're seeing where the, the legislature in the existing law has come in and said, let's create an enclave. And so there's a legitimate argument, although I admit that it's, it's, it's a small argument. I am arguing the minority rule, um, to be perfectly clear. Um, but the argument on the federal level is that because this goes against a 100-year history of approving the constitutionality of zoning, that it is not yet tested, and that we have to go blank slate back to the basics of the Constitution and argue whether or not you can have a hole in a zoning code. Mm -hmm. Because zoning survives, mm -hmm. as Rep. Turco put a few minutes ago, zoning survives through protection because someone somewhere has to draw lines, and so the courts defer very heavily when either the people or their representatives draw the lines. Uh, and, and so 
kind of the federal constitutional argument we're making in Rockport is why is it okay to suddenly create a, a zone where there are no rules? Um, if you think about it, everyone knows property rights. Every five-year-old knows if I look at it's mine. Uh, but zoning is how we tell our neighbor what they can put in their backyard. And so our ability to control our neighbor's property is somewhat restricted. It's a compromise we come to. And the cases in the hundred years of zoning history that have proved it have been very narrow. It's resulted in a very predictable body of law. But this creating an enclave where there are no rules is a whole departure from the hundred year constitutional history. Yep. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, we're, we're, we're definitely uh, sort of teetering on, on, at the end of our time here, but just, uh, just in terms of what's next, um, obviously we're going to battle uh, the obstruction of our citizens initiative petition, our very lawful citizens initiative petition. This town has a history of rebuffing uh, voters' rights. Not okay, uh, and we're not okay with that. And thank you, Michael, for all of your immense work on this. I just, I cannot thank you enough. There is not enough thank yous in the world, truly. Um, also, we're prepping for our exemption case, which is coming up in November. We did give Eric Haskell some, some more time. He was very busy with the Milton case. I think it went well uh, for us today, but we'll, that remains to be seen. Nonetheless, um, as Representative Turkio mentioned, there's more stuff coming. So if we can get an exemption from this, even if Milton wins and the four grants survive, there will absolutely be people on that council that are still looking for us to comply because this is now a political issue. Exactly. And we need to get out of this stuff. We should never have been looped in in the first place. Yeah. 2.7 miles away is Lydia Edwards sitting in her exempt town. Yeah. Yeah. Five, five, uh, oh, yes, yeah. Hi. Yeah, but Hi. Oh, yeah. Too. Yeah. Thank you for everything oh. you do. Oh. Hi, I'm Gia Tamas. I am running for your state Senate here in Third Suffolk. Um, I'm sorry. Your name. I'm sorry. Oh, Gianna Tamas. Yes. So I, I grew up in the district. I've always lived in Winthrop. Um, but with that being said, long story short, is one of the reasons why I'm running against Lydia Edwards is because of this situation. This, even though it was handed down from the higher above, as a state senator, we should have all petitioned it. This shouldn't have even gone through in any capacity whatsoever, as much as we can try and fight for it in the legal genre. Um, so tomorrow night, we are doing a Meet the Candidate. We invited Libby Edwards multiple times on her terms, moderator, all the stuff. She refused. So it'll just be me. So if you'd like to meet myself and um, my viewpoint and what have you, we'd love to have you down the senior center at 5 p.m. Um, we just really appreciate, like, beyond belief, Diana, and all you've done. And um, Representative Turco, we really appreciate you as well in standing with us as a community. It really means a lot to us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so just, just to wrap it up here, um, I think, I don't think we're going to solve it tonight unless someone has some, no, some not groundbreaking... Not. Uh, idea, but certainly uh, we are not being represented in, uh, at the local level. Uh, I uh, am a big proponent of going back to town meeting and not the representative kind, like the kind where everyone shows up and you stand up and they're here. Um, and I don't think it's very hard to do um, at all. So it's probably just another position. <laughs> uh, so I mean, we'll talk about it. Obviously, we're all connected over social media. Um, and, and another thing is, I don't, I don't know if I'm in the minority, majority, but having gone through this situation, I don't think that these infractions and obstructions should go unaddressed. Um, the blatant uh, blocking of a hearing on our, our legal petition to vote by uh, uh, you know, officials is, is, a, is problematic and, and certainly uh, can cannot go uh, unaddressed in my in my mind. But um, we need to decide what to do about that as a community. Is there anything we can do? I mean, immediately in terms of filing a complaint with the state yeah. at, uh, about the, some of these things? Because so it's beyond three A. I mean, it's well beyond three A. They're just not listening. Um, so the problem, as Rick Turco may be able to tell you, it's more detail is that the state government is a whole octopus of departments and arms. 
So for example, if you had a complaint about open meeting law, you write to a specific division of the Attorney General's office. If you have a complaint about public records, you write to a specific division of the Secretary of State's office. And these departments, will they all mean well, and they all apply their own statutes, unless you know them or have someone walking you through them, it's really hard to know where exactly to land. Which isn't to say that you shouldn't try. It's just um, it requires some insider knowledge. Yeah. Sorry, Diane is not going to like this, nor is Attorney Walsh, but um, I just, this woman right here, Diana Vienz, is a flippant warrior, um, and I am so grateful for what you've done for our community. Sorry, I'm emotional. Um, just for what you've done for our community, and Attorney Walsh. You know, I've been in the legal field, well, I've been a little retired for two years, but I've worked with a lot of attorneys, um, a lot of really great attorneys, and you're just a flipping step above. Um, and, but, but, but truly though, the, the amount of, the, the amount of time, Attorney Walsh, that you've dedicated to this community, you know, free of charge, just because you're passionate and you believe in democracy and constitutionality, did I say it? Um, I, I, I just truly can't say enough about you. When I got to watch you in court maybe a month ago, I literally sat there in awe, and I've seen attorneys talk. You're something special. And the fact though that truly, that you have donated your time to this community and, you know, again, but with, of course, with Diana, but, but again, like, you two are rock stars, and again, you know, Diana, the time you've taken away from your job, your family, and everything else, I thank you, I am honored to be your friend, and everyone in Winthrop should truly, whether you are actually pro 3A or, or yes to 3A, should applaud these two people for wanting us to vote. We are not looking for anything miraculous here. We just want our right to vote. Mm -hmm. And this has been said, but I'm gonna say it again because I'm not an attorney. We have followed the bloody charter. We have followed state law. We have done everything right as a committee and our town is doing what they want. It is time to rise up Speak our truth. We are, we are losing our democratic rights here. But thank you to these two amazing, amazing people, and she's gonna be mad at me. But, but thank you, because I'm, I'm indebted to you. And whether you're yes or no to 3A, everyone should be indebted to you guys for just fighting for rights for us to vote. That's all we're asking for. So thank you truly.